Okay, so our next speaker is Daniel Clower. He's going to talk about modular curves and the refined distance conjecture. Yes. Hello, hope you can all hear me. Does it work? Perfect. Okay, maybe I'll speak up a bit. So um, the title, first of all, it's a pleasure for me, of course, to speak at this wonderful conference. Um, the title is the same as um, that of the second paper, which just appeared recently, and builds on previous work uh, together with my collaborators in Munich, uh, where we probe one of the swampland conjectures, namely the distance conjecture, and more precisely, a refinement of the distance conjecture in a color BR moduli spaces. So the plan for today's talk is that I will first uh, review the distance conjecture and its refinement uh, that we're then going to put to the test. Uh, in the second part, I will review uh, what we did in the first paper where we uh, mainly used mirror symmetry calculations to probe the conjecture. And in the last part of the talk, I will then discuss a new paper where um, we use insights inspired by heterotic to a duality. Okay, so what is the distance conjecture? I think it was briefly mentioned uh, this morning already in the nice review talk by Thomas. The distance conjecture states that uh, if we approach an infinite distance point in field space, then there must be an infinite tower of states uh, which comes down and uh, does so at an approximately exponential rate. So the tower that we have here on the left-hand side gets heavily compressed and um, more and more states enter our effective field theory as we approach the infinite distance point. This is inspired by uh, the behavior of many string compactifications, uh, but true told more generally. Now, uh, the tower of states, uh, the identity of this tower uh, can be, they can be of different kinds, uh, but the emergent string conjecture states that uh, all that can really happen is that either we have a decompactification limit at infinite distance, where we have an infinite tower of uh, linearly spaced kaluza klein states, or the second option is that we don't get the dominant tower is not a kaluza klein state, but rather a tower of string excitations. And because of the tension of the string, uh, the, the masses of the string excitations um, grow uh, like square then, uh, this is uh, easily distinguished from the first case. So the picture shows that uh, besides the decompactification, these emergent string limits can happen in various ways by wrapping uh, objects on shrinking cycles in the geometry. And there's also a deep relation between the distance conjecture and the weak gravity conjecture, which I will not be able to go into any detail today. Okay, so at first it's a rather powerful statement. It's a universality statement about these infinite distance points in field space. But uh, a second look reveals that it's actually very weak, at least in the original version. Because first of all, the decay rate is not specified in the conjecture. So if this is some very tiny number, the decay looks approximately linear for uh, yeah, a very long time. So this would not constrain our effective field theory model building at all. Of course, many work has gone into strengthening the conjecture in this regard, uh, thus providing bounds on values of alpha. So I think it's generally accepted that this is an order one number by now, at least in uh, string compactifications. Secondly, it is also a statement about geodesics in moduli space. So only about massless fields and uh, not about physical trajectories of massive fields, uh, which are following some roots in a scalar field potential. So this is also a constraint uh, when we try to apply this to model building. Um, so it's, it's mainly a statement about supersymmetric theories really at first. And also a lot of work has gone into uh, strengthening the conjecture in this regard. But uh, today we will focus on 
another weakness of the conjecture, another loophole, which is that it's really only a statement about the infinite distance points, but uh, in the bulk of moduli space where we lose control in absence of supersymmetry, uh, anything can really happen. So uh, we should fasten our seat belts and uh, try to venture into the bulk of moduli space in order to test the conjecture there. So uh, let us uh, continue on this odyssey. And uh, there has been a proposal that the distance conjecture should apply to uh, the bulk of the modular space or to finite field displacements uh, in the following sense, that if we follow a geodesic and modular space, the tau appears already after an order one distance in Planck units. And uh, the onset of this tower cannot be delayed any further. So this is the picture here. And slightly weaker statement is that there should not be a sequence of uh, theories with moduli spaces mn indexed by some integer. So we index these theories by some integer uh, such that the diameter of the bulk of the moduli space where we remove the infinite distance roads um, grows indefinitely. Of course, this is not really expected in string theory if we uh, think that we have a finite number of consistent vacua, uh, but uh, nevertheless, um, the stronger version of the refined distance conjecture states that the cutoff should be already at one and not, let's say, 10,000 Planck units. Okay, let's test this. So we will test it in type 2a compactifications on color BR three folds. And um, this is a very well controlled setting with n equals to two supersymmetry in four dimensions. And the moduli space splits into complex structure and uh, Kähler deformations. And we focus on the Kähler deformations which live in the vector multiplet modular space. Now, in order to test the conjecture, we compute distances. So we need a metric on the field space. And this metric is given in terms of a holomorphic prepotential due to n equals two supersymmetry. This has some tree level contribution, which is uh, given in terms of geometric data of the compactification but receives an infinite series of instanton corrections. And uh, if our Keller moduli, if our volumes of the compactification become small, the series expansion breaks down and we have to analytically continue. So this is hard to compute from uh, first principles in type 2a, of course. And uh, it is very well known that we can use mirror symmetry to uh, map this to a dual type 2b compactification and solve the theory at least uh, for, for the prepotential. So we uh, get the geometry on moduli space. So mirror symmetry states that the Keller moduli in type 2a are mapped to complex structure moduli in type 2b on the mirror color BL. And the prepotential for these can be computed exactly in terms of periods of the holomorphic three form. Just some geometric integral that we can perform on a case by case basis, so we get the prepotential and hence the metric on the Keller modular space. Our favorite color BR, the quintic, and its mirror, the mirror quintic, um, have been analyzed uh, in the early 90s. Um, and uh, the mirror map is very well known. So the complex structure modular space of the mirror quintic, uh, this has, uh, so we only have one Keller modulus for the quintic, so only one complex structure modulus for the mirror quintic. some special singularities in the moduli space, namely um, the large complex structure point far out here, Conifold point and the London Ginsburg point. And uh, we can map these uh, points also to the type 2a coordinate t. Um, so we see that t has some minimal value here. And uh, yeah, this is what works. And we are interested now not in the large uh, large complex structure region or the large volu volume region to which it maps, but rather the bulk of the modular space, which is down here. So what is the diameter of this region? Um, so again, technically we have to solve Pika Fuchs equations locally and patch everything together in a consistent global picture in order to get the metric. And once this is done, 
uh, we get a metric and can compute geodesics on, on the moduli space, which was done directly by us. Um, the quintic is not uh, the only one parameter Calabiao that we can think of. There are many others. And for the uh, toric examples, uh, they, most of them work completely analogously. Uh, there are always th three special points in the moduli space, one of them corresponding to large volume or large complex structure. And the other two can be at finite or infinite distance. And we are interested now in the case where only the large volume point is at infinite distance and the other ones are at finite distance. So we get this uh, same picture as for the quintic. So we compute the diameter of the bulk of this moduli space and we see it's always less than uh, one in diameter and decreasing uh, if we go away from the quintic actually. So there is nothing interesting to be found here and the refined distance conjecture is safe. Well, it would be much more exciting if we found a violation. So um, let's proceed. Manifolds. Uh, let's say more moduli. The picture of the moduli space also becomes a lot more complicated. Already for two moduli, uh, we get many different phases in the moduli space. And a typical Calabiao with, uh, let's say, order 50 or 100 Kela moduli um, is completely intractable in this way. But let's uh, stay, let's stick with H11 plus the two. So uh, we see that we have still this large volume phase in type 2A where everything is nice and has a geometric description, but we also have phases where one of the Kela moduli uh, takes a small value and all of the instanton corrections kick in. So these are the hybrid phases here. And then there is also one phase where both of the Kela moduli are small. And uh, in our 2018 paper, we computed uh, several characteristic diameters of, of these phases. For example, this one here, which we'll be interested uh, later in the talk, uh, is a very irrelevant numerical value of two, uh, 0 0.27, but it's also smaller than one. So uh, back then we thought, okay, at least in the examples we studied, the distance conjecture seems to be safe. Uh, here comes um, the new work. So we will reconsider the last example that I flashed, the two modular example in the context of heterotic to A duality. For uh, H11 equals to two, we can have much more exciting geometries because now we can have vibration structures. We can have a Calabiao vibration such that our Calabiao is fibered by a lower dimensional Calabiao. And the two examples that we can have is that either fibered by a one dimensional Calabiao, which is an elliptic curve or genus one curve, or it's fibered by a two dimensional Calabiao, which is a K3 surface. And this is a picture here on the right. So we will be interested only in the K3 vibrations here. And due to this K3 vibration, we have a so called emergent string limit according to the classification of uh, this paper here, where the fiber of the Calabiao shrinks such that uh, a five brain wrapped on the fiber on the K3, which gives a two dimensional object, uh, is a fundamental heterotic string which becomes light. And uh, this is, of course, very well known even from the 90s that uh, type 2A string theory is not only dual to type 2B on the mirror Calabiao, but also to heterotic on K3 times T2. So the Calabiao I flashed before. In fact, the canonical example of this duality. So this is fibered by a sextic K3 surface in a weighted projective space and is dual to a very special hydraulic string compactification where we tune the modular of the torus to a gauge enhancement point and also embed some uh, instantons uh, in this part of the gauge group. So this is the enhancement uh, SU2. And um, as I said, this is very well known from the 90s. Uh, and there was also uh, this uh, mirror map here um, suggested. So this is a map between the type 2B moduli and the hydraulic moduli. The hydraulic dilaton should map to one of these moduli phi. Uh, and the J function of the 
torus modulus in the hydraulic compactification maps to some combination of these two coordinates here. And the map is such that the large base limit where the, the P1, the, the spherical base of the color uh, approaches infinite size is mapped to the weak coupling limit in the hydraulic stream. And then we still have the other modulus that, that could be uh, in the type 2a description, the other Kähler modulus, or here's the coordinate psi. And as this sweeps out the complex plane, the pre-image, which is uh, the hydraulic modulus T, uh, goes once over the fundamental domain of SL2. So the moduli space in the large base limit, which is the slice here, really is the SL2 fundamental domain. And the metric on moduli space, which we computed using mirror symmetry before, very complicated compute computation involving hypergeometric series, um, now takes this very simple form, which is the uh, usual hyperbolic metric on the upper half plane. And geodesics in the upper half plane are just circles which start on the real line and end on the real line. So um, at least in this region of the moduli space, everything is very, very simple. So in this slide, we can compute this distance here again, uh, but using just the metric on the upper half plane, and it's a very trivial trigonometric integral, you get an exact value of log three over two square root two, which is approximately 0 0.4. And by inverting the J function locally, we can then match this to our previous calculation and see that there are actually uh, huge corrections uh, because the convergence of the periods in this region is rather bad actually, at least in the corners that we use. So uh, this gives us a new way of inter interpreting the old result and uh, making it exact at least for uh, the one diameter of one phase that we computed. And by its own, this would not be very exciting, but it turns out that this uh, generalizes now. There are other K3 fiber manifolds fibered by different K3 surfaces uh, which also give modular symmetries acting on the modular space. And uh, a few examples have been found in this paper here. Uh, so there are many more, uh, but the groups that are acting on the modular space are certain normalizers of congruent subgroups of SL2. So now we're not dealing with the full SL2, but with congruent subgroups. Thank you. And now the analog of the previous slide is that in the large base limit, the moduli space degenerates into a modular curve for this congruent subgroup, which is just uh, the quotient of the upper half plane by this congruent subgroup. So uh, really we get the moduli space by determining the fundamental domain of the action of this group on the upper half plane. And Interestingly, the congruent subgroups have uh, larger fundamental domains because we uh, kill some of the group elements. So uh, this might be an interesting challenge for the refined distance conjecture and turns out it is. So for these three examples that I had on the previous slide, we can compute the analogous distance uh, just by performing integrals in the upper half plane. And we find that the distances increase together with uh, this integer here in the bracket. So we get 0 0.6, 0 0.9, and for uh, four, which is actually a some, somewhat an anomaly, it's infinite. So this does not really fit into the um, discussion that we've had previously because now the point is at infinite distance and we do expect a tower. So also there, there's no violation of the conjecture. But if we can dial this integer higher and maybe get larger finite distances, then it was, uh, this would indicate some tension with the conjecture. So um, what we can do is now uh, look at these congruent subgroups for some arbitrary number n here, the integer, and the fundamental domains obviously get more and more complicated, uh, but we can still determine them and calculate the characteristic distances that we get between the special points here. And we see that they do increase logarithmically with n. So we can achieve large n, there might be some ten logarithmic tension with the conjecture. And then of course, the question is, does this arise in Calabial compactifications? So uh, are these uh, modular curves realized 
as some slices in Calabella moduli spaces. And what is known is that they do arise as the moduli space of uh, certain K3 manifolds. So if uh, we fix a very large Picard lattice for the K3 surface, um, then such a K3 surface has only one modulus, one complex modulus, and uh, this is mirrored to a K3, um, which has only one uh, one-dimensional rank one Picard lattice. Uh, which is a so-called uh, degree two and general degree two and polarized K3. Um, and this is defined by the property that it has an ample primitive ample divisor that satisfies um, that its self intersection is uh, 2n, where n is the integer that we have previously encountered. Why did we not see this, uh, these K3 surfaces before? Because um, the toric constructions of Calabi-Yau manifolds will only give us n less than four, less or equal than four, which are the examples that are flashed. But uh, polarized K3 surfaces of higher degree, of higher n, can be constructed in uh, Kersmanians. And this has been done in a series of papers by Mukai. And they do arise as complete intersections. Uh, which are determined by some uh, vector bundle. So we take a section of this vector bundle and take a generic section and look uh, what are the zeros of this section and this determines the Calabial. Sorry, this determines the K3. For example, for a degree 10 K3 surface, we can take as an ambient space the Grassmannian of two planes in a five dimensional complex space. So this is a six dimensional manifold and we take a certain vector bundle on this. So like projector space, also the Grossmannian of two planes uh, has a line bundle, which is called O1. There's uh, some properties. And uh, so we take this rank four vector bundle, take a generic section of it, and then the zero locus of this section uh, will have co-dimension four because the rank is four. So it gives a two-dimensional uh, manifold and it turns out that the canonical bundle is trivial, so it's a calab. Yeah, it's a K3. So now we want to have this uh, as a fiber of our uh, calab Yau threefold. So how do we go about doing this? Now we want to fiber the whole situation over P1. So the problem is, of course, that the P1 has a curvature on its own, and also the uh, twist of the fibration will induce some curvature. So the result will not necessarily be a color biao. But uh, at least there exists a notion of a Grassmann bundle where we replace the five dimensional vector space from before by a five dimensional vector bundle, which determines the twist of our vibration. Um, so this will be a vector bundle over P1. So we take some rank n vector bundle E over P1. Uh, for the example before, n would be five. And then there exists the notion of a Grassmann bundle associated to this vector bundle, which you can think of as a, a local version of, of this Grassmannian over the base of the vector bundle. So now, as I indicated before, the canonical class uh, will change in this process and uh, will not be trivial anymore. So we have to twist the vector bundle from before a bit, but uh, in some cases it can be done and we get a color BL threefold. So provided uh, that the result is smooth, we obtain the desired color BL threefold. And in the paper, we find a configuration for vector bundles that at least tentatively, we did not check smoothness and uh, did not perform many of the necessary computations to verify this uh, in all detail. Uh, realized values of n up to 19. So at least moderately large n seems to be possible. So the question then is, is the refined distance conjecture violated by these models? And uh, clearly more work is needed in order to uh, decide this. I should mention that a very similar construction has also appeared recently in a very nice paper uh, by Knapscheidegger and Schimanek where they constructed not K3 vibrations, but genus one vibrations with a five section. 
So that's it. To summarize, what we have done is we have tested the refined distance conjecture, which is placing bounds on, on the diameter of the bulk of the modular space using mirror symmetry and hydraulic to a duality. For one dimensional color BR manifolds, uh, we have seen that mirror symmetry is a very efficient tool to calculate the geometry of modular space. And we have seen that there is no tension with the conjecture for H11 equals to 2. We have seen that uh, K3 vibrations could, uh, in principle, uh, lead to some tension with the refined distance conjecture if the appropriate Calabiao manifolds uh, can be constructed for very large n. Now, there, there must be some bound on n, of course, because the Calabiao landscape is expected to be um, bounded. But uh, yeah, also interestingly, we only have a finiteness result so far for uh, genus one fiber Calabiaos, but not for the generic K3 vibrations. Okay. Um, the large N that we need necessarily involves some constructions that go beyond toric geometry, which is interesting on its own and uh, deserves to be studied further. And we have constructed, uh, in particular, a construction that uses Kersmanian bundles. So the open questions are for which values of n do smooth color by all manifolds exist and what is the maximum value? So this is the uh, question which will decide about this conjecture. And another interesting question is if these color by alls exist and are smooth, then what is the global structure of the modular space? We only have analyzed one slice of the modular space, which is the weak coupling limit. It's uh, in some sense the most trivial part of the modular space. There's much more to it. And what are the precise hydraulic tools of these compactifications? And it's also known that the Grassmannian admits uh, toric degeneration. So uh, maybe we can also find connections to the known color Biao landscape, find extremal transitions between these manifolds and other manifolds uh, which have toric realizations. And um, there's also a citation I'm, I'm missing here, which I will add on the slide, will be uploaded. Um, because there is also previous work on, on such, such idea. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Other questions? Uh, Emmanuel? Thanks. Um, I was just wondering, so if you trust the uh, refined distance conjecture, assume it's correct, then um, what would you predict for these uh, Brasmanian based Calabiaos? I mean, would you say that they can't be smooth? Would something else interesting happen? And like, what would be the largest integer n that you would then predict? Yeah, as we have seen uh, in this table here, which I did not give you enough time to analyze. Um, the distances don't grow very rapidly. So yeah, it really depends on, on what you're satisfied with. Uh, so uh, certainly exponentially large values of N should not be allowed, but you might say that, uh, so I personally don't have a very strong opinion on this, but you might say that the value of, of two is still okay. So you could have any even like, 12 or even larger and so on. Yes. Thanks. More questions? Yes, please. Over there. Hi. Hey, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, so in the beginning, you mentioned uh, that in the absence of precise bounds for the rate of the exponential decay of the heavy states, uh, it's hard to constrain to constrain the effective field theory, right? Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, you know, assuming we did have these sharp bounds, um, how would you go about constraining an effective field theory which does not have a priori, in, in generically, the information about these heavy states? Like you only get them inside the effective field theory when they become light. And then it's, you know, it's not the effective field theory you start with. So how would you 
given a, like a generic effective field theory, how would you use those bounds to potentially exclude it or say anything uh, interesting about it? Yeah, it's, it's still hard. I mean, it's also model, model dependent, I guess, then what happens. Uh, but for me, the, the distance conjecture is more of a, of a warning sign that one should be careful when going large distances and really scrutinize whether the model holds up um, to its promises. And also there is this concept of the species scale, which should be a hard cutoff to the effective field theory, um, which is related to the scale of the tower. But again, that is then model dependent. Yeah, I guess my question was, how can you determine the scale of the tower if you don't know what the tower is within the effective field theory? Like if you have a higher dimensional theory, maybe you can use like Kaluza Klein towers and whatnot to, to determine that there's something else. But if you don't have that information, I'm not sure how you would have it there. Thanks. Okay, so I think there are no more questions either from the online participants, so we can move on. Well, first, uh, thank Yeah, so uh, Andre, are you ready? Uh, yes, hi, can you hear me? Hello? Andre, are you ready? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, maybe you can speak a bit louder. Okay, I try. Um, can you hear me now? Hello? Yeah, can you speak a bit more? We are testing the sound. Okay, uh, right. Okay, we'll see. I will introduce you. So our next speaker is Andre Lucas. He's going to tell us about reinforcement learning and a string model building. Okay, th thanks very much. So can you hear me now? Yeah, we hear you with some noise, but uh, go okay. on and we'll see how it okay. goes. Well, well, thanks very much for the invitation, first of all. Um, it'd be very nice to be there, but I wasn't quite ready to travel yet. So I'll be talking about reinforcement learning and string model building. So it's a bit of a change from previous topics. And this is work in collaboration with Steve Abel, Andre Constantin, and my student, Thomas Harvey. So here, here's the plan. So there'll be a short introduction and motivation, um, a bit to tell you about the basics of reinforcement learning. And then I'll illustrate that with a toy example, which is supposed to indicate or to show that geometrical engineering is possible with this method. And then I'll apply it to the actual case of interest, uh, which is a certain class of, of string models, which is otherwise not, not very much explored. And if I have time, I'll talk about another algorithm, a genetic algorithm that we've used to check our results and then I'll conclude. 
Okay, so introduction. So as, as you know, string theory generates very large and, and very diverse data sets, and they pose a number of challenges, some of which I've listed here. Uh, computation of some of this data can be quite tricky. Sometimes uh, the data sets can be very large, and sometimes we really miss the structural insight to do something, for example, like bottom-up bottom -up string model building. And so uh, an obvious question that people have start, started asking a few years back is, can machine learning help to deal with some of this? And the initial approach uh, that was mostly in the context of supervised machine learning um, has probably answered that with, with yes. Um, there is a very large number of, of different types of data, some of which I've listed down here, for which supervised machine learning, so machine learning that relies on a prepared labeled data set is quite successful. And in terms of, of these, um, these challenges posed by the string landscape, um, this kind of approach probably helps with the first of these points and incrementally in the sense that it improves somewhat, somewhat the speed possibly with the second of these points, probably not so much with the third. So in this talk, I'll be uh, focusing on another approach to machine learning, which is reinforcement learning. And this approach um, is hopefully is going to help with uh, the points two and three. So re reinforcement learning is, is the kind of machine learning that, that's been used by uh, the Google AlphaGo system a few years back, uh, very, very, uh, successfully. So it is known to be efficient for very large environments, which, which is the kind of environments we're facing. And it uses the neural networks constructively, it plays Go, for example. And it has already been shown to be effective in the context of some models, uh, in, for example, in these two papers here. So the questions um, that I'll be asking, or the main question I'll be asking is, can reinforcement learning be used constructively to build models, string models, with certain prescribed properties. And more in detail, can, can that help explore large classes of, of models? Um, can we construct models with, with these prescribed properties? And uh, can we somehow extract from this system certain model building strategies? And so this will be studied, studied in, a, in a particular class of examples, which is, which is meant to be challenging from this point of view, which hasn't, hasn't much, much been explored otherwise. But in principle, this, this kind of idea might work in, in many different contexts. So let me talk a little bit about reinforcement learning, uh, basically just by presenting a cartoon. So reinforcement learning, uh, other than um, different, different from, uh, from supervised learning, does not rely on a pre-compiled data set, but creates the data by exploring an environment. And so this environment has states, uh, which might be those geometrical objects. In our case, will be string models, of course. And this space of states is explored by an agent, which moves along and does so subject to a goal. The goal in this uh, simple example might be, for example, to get to objects with many edges. And as the agent moves uh, to sort of worse objects, objects with fewer edges, say here and here, uh, it attracts a penalty. And then in those last two steps where it gets better, it would acquire a bonus. So in this case, in this sense, you, uh, in this way, you create what is called an episode and you, um, you attract a reward, penalty, a bonus as you uh, move along this episode. Now, this, is, uh, this episode is not completely um, unguided. It's not random. It's, in fact, guided by a neural network in the sense that the neural network's input will be one of those states here, and the output will be the action which tells the agent where to go next. Now, initially, of course, this network is just randomly initialized, but it is then being trained precisely by these episodes. So as the agent has performed one episode, there's a data set which cons consists of states, actions, and rewards that is being used to update the neural network 
and then the next the next episode is is being performed with this updated policy network and will therefore already know something about the environment and then that this this cycle is is continued until uh, there's hopefully some kind of convergence and of course the the end the end goal is uh, in our context will be to get the agent to move to uh, what is often called terminal states, so states with the desired properties as efficiently as possible. So how do we want to apply this to string model building? So the environment in the string context would be a family of string models or could, could also be quantum field theory models. The states will be the specific models the action will be some small modification of the model that I'll specify in the examples I'll show later. And the reward will be somehow computed from uh, the deviation of the model from whatever the desired features are. And so the, we have uh, looked so far at two examples of this in detail. One is in fact a quantum field theory example, which has to do with Frogat Nielsen models for quark masses. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about this, um, but if you're interested, you can have a look at this paper here. And the other one has to do with, um, with monad bundles on, in Calabiao, um, heterotic models. And so this is what I'll focus on here. There are various flavors of this reinforced algorithm we'll be using two of them called reinforce and actor critic and they're realized as mathematical packages. So let me be more specific about this and give you a toy example um, for how this, how this might work in, um, in the context of trying to engineer geometrical properties. So we'll be focusing on a specific Calabiao threefold X and we're considering the set of all line bundles L over it and line bundles are in practice labeled by an integer vector with this dimension here. And line bundles have an index, uh, which, is, which can be computed from this formula. Intersection numbers and second churn class of the tangent bundle are fixed for the given Calabiao, and then it's a cubic in those line bundle integers k. And so the, the toy question we were asking is, can we find on this given Calabiao line bundles, uh, which have a certain uh, given value for this index, so a, a given target index, in other words. So the mapping of the reinforcement system to the models is now a bit more specific. So the environment now consists of all these integer vectors suitably constrained to make it finite. So state is one of these integer vectors and an action will be a small modification by which we mean here um, adding plus or minus one to one of those integers. And the, the reward is then computed from a value assigned to each of these states, which measure, measures the deviation of the state's index from the intended target. So, so we've looked at this for an example, very simple example, where, uh, which is just two dimensional. So the integer vectors have just two entries. So that's, that's of course uh, useful to visualize it and with a target index of 18. And we've, we've run this system. Um, so here are some measurements taken uh, during the training of the system. So the loss goes to zero, that's what you're hoping for. More importantly, um, the, this is the, the fraction of terminal episodes. And you see this, this starts at zero. So, so this is when the, um, when the neural network doesn't know much about the environment yet, and then it very rapidly goes to one, while the average length of episodes to a terminal state goes to something very small, about the order of five. So this is, this is very successful. It leads to terminal states for all episodes in, in well, about six steps. And it's found all terminal states during training. That's not so surprising because it's a, a fairly small environment, but the fact that it uh, goes there efficiently and in, in all cases, that is a good indication. And so to give you a bit more of a feel for how this works, here's a plot of this environment. So this is K1 and K2, the two line metal integers, 
So each dot on this plot corresponds to um, a line bundle and the, the level lines co correspond to uh, values of constant index. And the, the black uh, fat dots here, they are the line bundles with a given target index 18. And so here are two examples of episodes that the trained neural network generates starting from this pink points here, or yellow points, and then going along the green line very quickly approaching one of the nearby terminal states with the right target index. And so you, you can do this a bit more systematically and you can start an episode from each state because it's a small a space, you can, you can do this. And in this way, you can, you can see where this episode ends up, in which of the terminal states does it end up, and thereby find the basins of attraction. And so everything, for example, in this green region here, any, any episode starting in this green region here, will end up at the corresponding terminal state, which is this empty dot here at the corner. So there is, there is a message here in this, um, in this plot. Which is, which is kind of a, an intuitive idea of why reinforcement learning might be very good, or is, is very good at exploring large environments. If you imagine scanning this space, trying to find the terminal states, then you would have to perform some algorithm which, which scales with the total number of states. You'd be just trying out every state. If you have your trained network from reinforcement learning, then all you need to do is pick one state per region here, and then the neural network will quickly guide you to the terminal state uh, that, uh, that this region is attracted to. And so in this case, the algorithm will roughly scale with the number of terminal states, which of course might be a much smaller number. Okay, so that was, that was the toy example. So now let me apply this to a more realistic example, which has to do with uh, models with, with based on monads. So these are hydraulic models, uh, which need a vector bundle. And this vector bundle uh, can be constructed from a monad sequence, uh, this short exact sequence here, where B and C are line bundle sum. So this is sort of a, a grown up version of the, of the previous case where we have not just one line bundle, but uh, two sums. And if we imagine that the, the, each of these line bundle integers in here they take on say 10 values, then this is an indication of the size of uh, this space, where H, H remember was the Hodge number of the Kabyao. And even for rather small examples, so Hodge numbers two and three and relatively small ranks of these um, line bundle sums, you can see that the space of states is already rather substantial. And so I, I do not really know of any, any kind of trick that would allow you to explore uh, spaces of this size with a computer systematically. And this shows because only very few examples of successful or phenomenological viable models within these spaces are known, which have basically been found by, by eyeballing. Okay, so how does the mapping of reinforcement learning to models look like here? So we have an environment which now consists of all these um, pairs of, of line bundle sums, which define the monad, again, restricted in some way. The action is now similar to the previous one, except that we want to um, sort of add or subtract one simultaneously in B and C in the same row, um, because we want to maintain this condition here. The, the equality of the first term classes. And then the reward is, is computed uh, you know, in spirit, very similar to the previous one. But now we um, compute a value that is based on the deviation from a, a number of desired properties, which include things like the curl asymmetry, whether the anomaly condition is satisfied, etc. And the, term, the meaning of a terminal state is now basically a model which is uh, a candidate standard model with the right kind of spectrum. So we've tried this out on the same manifold that we had before this uh, bicubic manifold with uh, Picard number two. 
for SO10 guts, which are broken down to the standard mode by a Wilson line, and initially semi-positive monads, so monads which start at zero. And the, these are the, the training measurements. As, it, as you can see, they uh, look sort of similar. Again, the, this terminal fraction here is, is probably the most impressive one. Again, it starts at zero, it, it lingers for quite a while, um, but then it sort of explosively uh, moves up to one. So every state um, will be guided to a terminal state uh, in, 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 a very, in a very small number of steps. And I should say, uh, doing this doesn't actually take a supercomputer. This is just done in, in about an hour on a single CPU. So the summary of, of what we find is, is as follows. So first of all, I, sh I should stress that this is in no way exploring the entire space. It's exploring a very small sample from the space uh, while it's training. I couldn't possibly do the whole because it's so large. And <coughs> it finds the one standard model that we know to exist in this space, which was found in an earlier paper and its permutations but no other terminal state, which probably indicates that there isn't any other in this state. And it leads to terminal states, so in, in other words, to this standard model for basically all of, of the episodes wherever you start them, and it gets there rather quickly. So that, that was a good start, but of course we would like to find models that are not previously, have not previously been constructed. So we've been um, enlarging the environment somewhat. So now we also allow a negative entry. So that's certainly something that hasn't been really systematically explored before. And the story is very similar. I'm not going to show the plots because they are in fact quite similar. It again takes about an hour, a tiny sample um, of the environment uh, used during training. Very successfully in 100% of all episodes, it's guided to terminal states in about 15 steps. And we find 59 terminal states. And if we check sort of further properties that haven't been checked during training because they're too time consuming, we find in the end, there are 17 promising models. So these are new standard like models and they'd be very difficult to find, quite, quite probably impossible to find with systematic scans. So this, this system um, really can, can do something that we weren't able to do before. And then we, we've been uh, a bit more ambitious and we've been trying this out on a manifold with Picard number three again with negative entries allowed. So this is already quite a big space here. And the results are very similar. It takes a bit longer to try now about a day on a single CPU. Um, but again, very successful trained network. Um, and now we find a rather substantial number of terminal states we haven't checked them all because the number is so large for uh, additional properties such as mirror families, but uh, estimates of samples suggest that there are about 500 consistent models within this database. So we've we found a whole new class of standard-like models, which given the size of this state space would be virtually impossible to find with any standard scanning methods. Uh, Andre, you have yeah. 10 minutes left. Okay, thanks, that's, that's great. Okay, so you, you might want to learn some strategies about model building from this system. And so here is one indication how you might go about to do this. So the, the value that each state has is composed from uh, various different contributions, which are sort of listed here. So I've, I've mentioned some earlier, so correct index, anomaly satisfied, is it a bundle, et cetera, et cetera. And this is the typical, uh, this, this graph indicates the typical way in which, or the typical order in which uh, these various properties are satisfied. So you see that uh, something like the index and uh, the, um, the, the stability checks, they are satisfied rather late and some of the other properties are satisfied rather early. So this might give you some indication about model building strategies that you might want to pursue. Okay, so this is this is basically the the thing the, the bit on the RL that I want to wanted to talk about. Um, of course, while we have found many models, it's not clear 
how exhaustive that is, that's, that's very difficult to check because the environment is so large. So the best we can do is to try to cross that, check that with um, a different algorithm. So we've looked at genetic algorithms and we've applied this to the same kind of environment. So to do this, we, we take this, these uh, integer matrices here, which represent these monads and we convert them into binaries. The fitness that is sort of the, the guiding number in genetic algorithms, uh, that is taken to be exactly the same as the value function that we've used in the reinforcement learning case. So that makes, makes the two methods rather comparable. We create a population of those matrices or those bit sequences, about 250 as it happens. And we evolve them uh, according to these algorithms by crossing, which is something that is controlled by the fitness and by mut mutation. And of course, the goal would be that after we do this for a number of generations, uh, the population has acquired many fit individuals, which in our case means terminal states or standard models. So this, this works actually uh, impressively well. So here's, here's a run uh, where we where have plotted the fraction of terminal states in, in the population as a function of the generation. So this sort of saturates at 40% at of, of the population. So with, with 250, that's quite a lot of, of models. And after about running this for 10 times, we find about the same set of models for the bicubic that the reinforcement learning has found. It's not completely exactly the same, but there's a, there's a significant overlap. So we, I, I think at least we are assured by this that we are not missing a sizable chunk of the models. And then for the trilinear, there's, there's a similar result and we haven't quite fully made the comparison, but, but again, there's, there's a significant overlap between the two sets uh, that we find. So you might ask which one is, um, sorry, I think I, my presentation might have been stuck. Sorry, I don't know why that's happening, but let me try to, Stop this and reconnect. Okay, so, so this is the comparison between reinforcement learning and genetic algorithms. So this is for the bicubic, which seems to suggest that the genetic algorithm might perhaps be more efficient, but the Oops, I'm sorry. The conclusion is actually the reverse for this Calabria with Picard number three, where the genetic algorithm, the, where the reinforcement learning outperforms the genetic algorithm. And we're still looking at various other comparisons between these two, um, which, is, which is work currently in progress. So let me summarize. Um, so I, I think I've demonstrated that RL can engineer topological properties and it can learn the rules for geometrical string model building. So this has been done in uh, a toy model and for this monad case, but I believe that this can probably be applied in many contexts. And just, just as uh, indicated by, for example, this, this success of, of Google AlphaGo, uh, reinforcement learning can indeed be used to explore very large environments and, and find uh, models with prescribed properties within. In particular, it, it can find new standard model candidates. These trained networks, they're literally built models. So they, you, you can feed some sort of um, um, guess into this network as a starting point, a model that is perhaps reasonable but not quite successful and uh, the, the neural network will guide you from there to a nearby successful model. And we've checked using genetic algorithms that, uh, that this is indeed finding a, a relevant chunk of the models that exists 
exist within these environments. Now, there are many questions for extensions, further directions, some of which I've listed here. I think the, um, the main question we had, uh, have at the moment is, how does this scale with the Picard number we've only explored, Picard number two and three so far? And is this something that can be used to really explore the full string landscape systematically? So thanks very much. Thank you very much, André, for the interesting talk. Let's see if there are questions from the audience. No questions here. What about uh, participants? I've seen, I've seen a raised hand somewhere. Carlos? Who is uh, Carlos? Carlos, please go ahead. Uh, now, can, can you hear me, Andre? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, okay. So, look, the, the question is, is, um, is, is certainly not technical, right? So, I, I don't know the technicalities of what you do, and so... Mm -hmm. Okay, um, go ahead. <laughs> more generic in, in this sense. In this way, you are finding models Right, starting from a starting point and then putting penalties or advantages, etc. Yes. Can you somewhat associate that with the dynamics? So, if if I if I were to use the methods that 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 you use to to see how a roll a ball rolls down a slope, right? Would I found the minimal action principle? You see what I'm after. You have a way of doing things. Can, can we map that into a dynamics? I understand that there are dynamical things that you put, like, for example, the cancellation of anomalies, et cetera. But can we, can we with this, construct what's the dynamics that is finding the correct models? I don't know if the question is understand. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I certainly haven't tried something of the kind you, you're proposing. I mean, I guess what you're proposing, or what you're asking is, can you use this sort of thing to find physical laws, principles. Exactly, exactly. Right. exactly. And I think you, you, you might be able, I mean, people have been trying to use this with other methods, with, with, um, with supervised learning, I think, uh, also. But I think in principle, that might be possible. Um, you, you, might, you might be able to, to design a system which is more general than the one I'm talking about, which uh, as an environment contains a large class of possible models, Right. So, you, for example, you, you could you could have a, a system which contains a large class of quantum field theories, mm -hmm. and you could um, you could train it on reproducing uh, certain scattering amplitudes by right. uh, feeding into it experimental data. Exactly. I mean, we've we've been trying something a little bit along those lines with this Fogart Nielsen mm -hmm. uh, method. This is it's still a, a much more limited thing, but we've we've just been. Uh, looking at basically the, the you cover sector of the theory and the environment is sort of all the Frog and Nielsen models that you can build from, you know, putting in scalars and so on. And then we've been fitting this to the quark masses and the, the mixing angles. Mm -hmm. And, and, that, and that, that works, but you could envisage doing this in a much grander context, of course. Good, good, good. good. So, so in principle, you, you can find or you can trace this searching that the computer does to some dynamics. It might not be easy to find, but it, it's yeah, easy to yeah. Find. I think so, in the, in the sense that you you know what the, what the theory is once you're done. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Uh, any more questions? Then I think uh, I think we can thank uh, Andre for the nice talk. <laughs> Uh, we should move on to our next and last speaker, who is uh, Robert de Melococ.
Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, we, we see your screen. We hear you well. So, okay, I think we can start. Our next Thanks speaker so is Robert de Meloco. Is going to speak about quantum error correction and holographic information from my local holography. Please go ahead. Thanks very much for the invitation. And um, it's a real pity I couldn't join you guys uh, in Kofu. Today I'd like to share with you some efforts to understand some of the mechanisms behind holography. The work I'll be talking about was presented in the archive preprint quoted. It was done together with a PhD student, Yunus Gandotti, a postdoc, Narina Tahiri Bindisoa, and a colleague, Yaku van Zeil. I'm not going to be very good with sharing references during the talk, but let me just mention two references. The first one is by Das Sinibitsky, where um, a basic idea for bilocal holography was uh, put forward. And then the second reference here is... Um, one that developed the basic bilocal map that I will be discussing today. So what I'll be adding today is really to discuss the physics of the map and to relate it to some of the more recent ideas that have been playing a role in holography. So what is the system that we're going to study? Well, we'll be studying the simplest possible conformal field theory you could imagine. This is just a free ON vector model in two plus one dimensions. We can solve this theory exactly um, at large n, we can calculate subleading corrections to any order. It's very straightforward to solve. As usual, a good question is to ask, what are the single trace primaries of this theory? The single trace primaries will be dual to the spectrum of particles in um, bulk gravity. So there's a scalar primary with dimension one, and then there's an infinite tower of spinning currents with any uh, spin 2s, so any even integer spin, and the dimension of these currents is 2s plus 1. The dual gravity, the scalar, is dual to a bulk scalar, and the spinning currents are dual to conserved currents. So this would be Vasiliev's higher spin theory. Um, we don't have a perfect understanding of the theory, but we do understand at the classical level which would correspond to the large N of the vector model. All that we will need from uh, Vasiliev's theory are the large N higher spin equations of motion. And I'm going to be following Metsayev when I write these down. So Metsayev works in ADS4 in Poincaré patch. He works in light cone gauge. So we set the gauge field to zero if one or more polarizations are a plus, and then the constraint from gauge fixing allows us to eliminate all gauge fields with a single minus polarization or more. So at the end of the day, the dynamical fields are just the X, Z polarizations. And let's say as result is rather remarkable. Uh, what he shows is the dynamical fields all obey a very simple equation of motion for the free theory. I've given that equation of motion in equation three, and it looks a lot like just um, a massless uh, wave equation. But this is one of the things that we'll want to reproduce. So I want you to try to remember equation three. Okay. So we'll be discussing bilocal holography. So let me tell you what is the basic claim. So holography is accomplished by two things. First of all, we do a change of the field variable that we're integrating over in the path integral. We change to a set of gauge invariant or bilocal variables in the CFT. The second ingredient is that we perform a change of the field theory coordinates to relate them to coordinates of the dual bulk space time. And let me explain to you how these two ingredients are motivated. The change of field variable is, is so that you reorganize the dynamics. And what this reorganization does is that the loop expansion parameter in the CFT is H bar, but after making this change of variables, the loop expansion parameter is one over N. And this is exactly the loop expansion parameter that we would expect for the dual gravitational theory. 
Why is the change of coordinates needed? Well, the buy local transforms in a product of the representation for the simple scalar field. So I've denoted the representation for the scalar field, V one half comma naught. It's the representation of SO2,3 with dimension one half and spin zero. And the bi local transforms in a tensor product of two of these representations. This representation is reducible. If you reduce it, you get a single representation of dimension one and spin zero and a direct sum of every even spin and the representation with spin S has dimension S plus one. So what you can see on the right-hand side of equation four, we naturally match the field content of the higher spin gravity. And if we want to go from a basis that is natural for the conformal field theory to a basis that is natural for the higher spin theory. So here I'm talking about a basis for SO23. We're going to accomplish that change of basis by performing a change of coordinates. So the change of field variables is so that we get the correct loop expansion parameter and the change of coordinates is motivated so that we get the natural action of the conformal group on our higher spin fields. So, so no knowledge of the dual gravitational theory is going into this at all. Okay, let's just discuss this change of field variables. So if you're gonna solve a quantum field theory, all you need to do is to evaluate some complicated integral, like I've shown you in equation five. Um, we want to study the limit that n goes to infinity. So you need to do an infinite number of integrals, which looks like a hard problem. But things become very simple when the theory has an O-N symmetry. In this case, the action is an O-N invariant. Supposing that the phi A are in the vector representation of O-N, which is what we've got. Then we know that the action S is a function only of phi A phi A. So instead of depending on these n variables, we depend on a single variable sigma. If we integrate out all coordinates orthogonal to sigma, we're left with an integral of the form in equation six. So now we have a single integral to perform, the integral over this invariant sigma. The reason why we've got an S tilde here is that by integrating over the directions orthogonal to sigma, the action is changes. And the reason why S tilde is multiplied by n is because we had a total of n variables and each of them contributes to S tilde. If you now do a saddle point approximation of equation six, you'll generate a loop expansion with one over n as the loop counting parameter. Concretely for our field theory, we'll be using the bi-local variable shown in equation seven. So we'll be using light cone coordinates to match to Metsayev. And our bi-local sigma is given by a product of two scalar fields. They're both at the same time, x plus. So I'm going to do a, a light cone quantization. But they're at different values of the x minus coordinate and the coordinate x, which is transverse to the light cone. Um, so it's worth noting that this bi-local, which I've shown again in equation eight, depends on a total of five coordinates, x plus, x1 minus, x1, x2 minus, and x2. The field sigma develops a large n expectation value. So we separate this into sigma naught plus one over root 10 times by eta. And it's this fluctuation eta about the background that we're gonna map to the higher spin fields. So I've now described the first ingredient that goes into bilocal holography, namely this change of field variables. Uh, what I would like to do now is to describe the change of coordinates. Before I do that, let me explain how I'm going to be um, organizing things in ADS4. One way to think about it, so I'm again gonna work in light cone coordinates in ADS4, but I can think I've got coordinates x plus, x minus, x, and z. And I've got an infinite number of fields. My gauge fields, one for each even integer, and my bulk scalar phi. Alternatively, I could think I've got x plus, x minus, x, z, and theta. I'm not going to change my metrics. So I'm thinking about theta as just some auxiliary bookkeeping coordinate. And now I imagine that I've got a single field 
that lives in five dimensions, not four. If I expand that single field uh, in a mode expansion in this theta coordinate, the coefficient of cos 2s theta is related to the gauge field of spin 2s as I've shown in equation 10. In this description, I've got a single field that depends on five coordinates, and that naturally or nicely seems to match the fact that the bilocal itself depended on five coordinates. Now, how do we relate the five coordinates of the bilocal to the five coordinates of this field phi? The bilocal will transform into tensor product in the CFT, so acting with some generator of the Lie algebra, we just get the usual co-product action. Now, as I've said, this tensor product representation is reducible, and it reduces as shown on the right-hand side of equation 11. If I am to act with one of the generators of the conformal group on our field phi, what I would like is to get the correct action on the component of spin 2s. So the last equation of this slide is defining what I'm going to call the direct sum representation of uh, 2, 3. And I must act in the correct way on all of the spin 2s components. How can we achieve that? In fact, we can achieve that simply by performing a change of coordinates. So the best way to describe this change of coordinates is to use the fact that in the bulk gravity, we've got translation invariance in X minus, and we've also got translation invariance in X minus in the CFT. So I'm gonna to move to momentum space and I'm gonna trade X minus for a momentum P plus. Then in the CFT, I've got the coordinates little x1, little x2, little P1 plus, little P2 plus and X plus. And this is the map that relates um, the CFT coordinates to the bulk coordinates, which is capital X, capital Z, P plus, and X plus. Z here is the holographic radial direction. We can invert this map, and there's a very simple expression for the bulk coordinates in terms of the CFT coordinates, as I've shown. And what happens here, it's easy to check just by explicit comp computation that the direct sum representation acting on our bulk field phi is related to the tensor product representation acting on the fluctuation eta. So here's a summary of bilocal holography. We use the bilocal field. It is this fluctuation eta that gets mapped to the field phi. Phi and eta are, are related by a simple multiplication by P plus and sine theta. And the relationship between the bulk and the CFT coordinates are shown on the middle of the page. By expanding phi in modes in this theta coordinates, we extract the field of spin 2s. Um, now, we haven't put anything of the gravity into this theory. So anything that we can reproduce from the dual gravitational theory is a non-trivial check for this proposal. So the first thing that we want to show is that it actually solves the bulk reconstruction problem. We know the equation of motion that is satisfied by the CFT field phi A. Using that equation of motion, we can derive the equation of motion satisfied by our bulk field capital phi. And when we go through this exercise, we reproduce the equation of motion that Metsayev gave for the highest spin field. To really solve the bulk reconstruction problem, the other thing that we need to show is that when you take the bulk field to the boundary, to z is equal to zero, you should reproduce the spectrum of single trace primaries of the CFT. In fact, that happens. It's a little bit of a detailed calculation, but there's an important formula that plays a role. And it's this one that I've shown here, P1 plus plus P2 plus to the power of S times by the cosine of this quantity equals the sum from k is equal to naught up to s. Now, first of all, what am I taking here inside the cosine? Well, if you remember, theta is two arctan P2 plus over P1 plus. So this is a cosine of two theta, where theta is the angle defined in my map. 
So P1 plus plus P2 plus the power of S times by the cosine of two theta gives me this specific polynomial over here. And the coefficients in this sum exactly match the coefficients that appear in the definition of the highest spin current. So we see by taking S derivatives of our field phi at the boundary, so Z has been set equal to zero, we reproduce the single trace primary. So basically using our recipe for bilocal holography, we've managed to show that our uh, bulk field satisfies the correct equation of motion. And at the boundary, it reproduces all of the single trace primaries of the CFT. So this is compelling evidence for the proposal. A natural question to ask now is which subregion of the conformal field theory, if any, is dual to a given subregion of the bulk? And this we can now answer using our map. This is a question that we ask at a fixed time x plus. So we fix the time in the CFT, we fix the time in the dual gravity, and we'd like to know on this fixed time slice, where do excitations in the CFT map into the bulk. The bilocal is constructed from two excitations. I'm going to imagine describing these two excitations as wave packets. I'll localize the first wave packet at X1. This is the coordinate transverse to the light cone and at P1 plus. And I will localize the second excitation at X2 and at P2 plus. And I'd like to use my map between the coordinates to figure out where does this bilocal map to in the bulk space time. Simply using the uh, map that I showed you in the coordinates, you can prove that this maps to an excitation of the bulk that is localized on the semicircle. So in a picture, we've got uh, the bilocal has got an excitation at X1 and excitation at X2. So this black horizontal line at the bottom of the figure is the boundary CFT. And it would map in the bulk to something sitting on the semicircle that you see. The direction transverse to this horizontal line is the holographic Z direction. And parallel to this horizontal line is the X direction of the ADS space. The radius of the circle is just X1 minus X2 over T. This angle theta over here, using some simple high school trigonometry, you can check that tan theta is equal to Z over X minus X1 plus X2 over two. And then using the map, you can check it's this expression in terms of P1 plus and P2 plus, and some trivial manipulations show that this angle theta is exactly the angle theta appearing in our map. So the bilocal will map to somewhere on the semicircle, and the exact theta that you land up at is fixed by the momenta P2 plus and P1 plus. So what we learn in this way if you have a region of the CFT shown by this red line over here, we construct the area of the bulk that is colored in green and has the boundary which is given by this black line. Now, this is all just coming from our holographic map. Something that's very interesting to ask is, what is the meaning of this black line that you see in this figure? Well, one thing that you can do is the following you can try to calculate just what is the length of that line. So if you freeze to a constant x plus slice on ADS4, that's the metric on this constant x plus slice. The length of the black curve is simply given by equation 16. And if you extremize this length, you find x squared plus z squared is equal to r squared. So the black line that you see is actually the curve that goes into the bulk that is of minimal length. If we were in higher dimensions, this is what you would have called the Ryu Takayanagi surface. So what we're able to reconstruct from the bulk is the region bounded on one side by the boundary and on the other side by the Ryu Takayanagi surface. But this is usually what you would call the entanglement wedge. That's the definition of the entanglement wedge. So what we're learning with our um, bilocal map is that we can perform uh, the construction of any bulk points that lie inside the entanglement wedge of the subregion of the CFT. So this nicely matches what is expected.
Uh, now, most of these discussions of homography, you have to restrict uh, to... Robert, you have 10 yes. minutes left. Okay. Okay. Uh, in, yes, thank you. Um, these descriptions of holography limit themselves to the code subspace. So subspace, what is the idea here? Observers can't access infinite energy states, and they can only access a subset of all fields. So we are going to study a code subspace, which is obtained by exciting a finite number of spinning fields, and the occupation number for each field will be bounded. So we'll have something like what's shown on the bottom of the slide, where we've got a finite linear combination of fields of different spins, giving us our bulk field. And then by, if we pick any bulk point P, by choosing different bilocals, we can have semicircles that intersect the bulk point P, giving us the value of P at different values of theta. If we do this for K distinct values of theta, we can actually disentangle the bulk field into its different spinning components. So if we work within the code subspace, not only can we reconstruct the bulk fields within the entanglement wedge, but we can also distinguish the spins of uh, the different fields in the bulk. This looks a lot like quantum error correction, so let me just explain to you why I say that. If we look at the subregion A, we can reconstruct everything inside the first semicircle. In particular, we can reconstruct point P. If we look at subregion B, we can also reconstruct point P. So you might think since you can reconstruct things from subregion A and you can reconstruct from subregion B, that perhaps you can reconstruct from the intersection of A and B. But in fact, if you limit yourself to the intersection of A and B, you can only reconstruct inside the gray shaded region. So you cannot reconstruct what's going on at point P. And this is really telling you that entanglement is a crucial element when you are trying to reconstruct the bulk. Another a very easy way to see this if we restrict ourselves to subregion A, we cannot reconstruct point P. If we restrict to subregion B, we cannot reconstruct point P. But if we take A union B, which gives us this much larger semicircle, then P, we can indeed reconstruct at point P. And if you want to get a semicircle that passes through C, you have to study by locals with one foot in A and one foot in B. So what that means is you're actually reconstructing the bulk for a field at point P from the entanglement between region A and region B, which again is in harmony with uh, the quantum error correction view of um, holography. Okay, so the Rio Takayanaki formula tells you how to turn the calculation of the entanglement entropy into some geometric maximization in the bulk. It tells you the entanglement entropy of some region A is given by the area of an extramal surface, M of A, which is homologous to A. This result has been rephrased uh, using the max flow min cut theorem, where we rewrite um, the extramal area in terms of the extramal flow of some vector field B mu. Um, it's been suggested that each of these field lines corresponds to a bit of entropy. And in our picture, in fact, these lines in the bulk are very reminiscent of the semicircle we find from the holographic map. And indeed, it's natural to interpret that as a bit of entropy because it's the entanglement between two particles that sit inside the CFP. So we would claim that our bilocal map gives us a very nice physical realization of bit threads. And the precise form of the curve that you get from holographic duality agrees with the curves of, uh, of the bit threads that were calculated in the paper quoted. Okay, I will skip that. Uh, the island formula that was explored recently is really based on the idea that there can be non-local relations between degrees of freedom that live inside the bulk. These non-local relations have become important, for example, for old black holes that have evaporated a lot. States of an old black hole, you'll have a cloud of Hawking radiation and you'll have many, many quanta excited. What could be the origin of these non-local identifications between degrees of freedom? Uh, when you've got such an excited state, the, the CFT will be able to tell that N is finite, it's not infinite. So we tried to look for non-local -re relations between degrees of freedom inside the finite N constraints of the CFT. 
So here's a very, very simple example. Let's say that N is one. Then if you take a product of two bilocals, in fact, this just corresponds to the product of these scalar fields. Because N is one, there's no index A that I sum over. And I can just rearrange the ordering of the fields. So I get a relation between the bilocals at the top here, evaluated at X1, Y1, and X2, P2, with the bilocals at the bottom, evaluated at X1, Y2, and X2, Y1. This finite end relation between the bilocals can be expressed as the determinant of a matrix M, which just simply expresses that the matrix, the two matrix M is rank one. We can do this for higher N, and I'm just going to give you an example of the kinds of constraints that are, arise when n is equal to 2. In this situation, each of the plots below is showing uh, three bilocals. The bilocals are located at x1, y1, x2, y2, x3, and y3. And the way the dots are joined tells you how the bilocals have been contracted. I'm going to take x1, y1, x2, y2 to be very close to each other. x3 and y3 are very close to each other but the first four points will be very distant to the last four points. The finite n relation for n is equal to two is the equation that I've written on the slide. The first two terms correspond to degrees of freedom that are located very near the boundary. The last four terms are related to degrees of freedom that are arbitrarily deep in the bulk. The finite n relations for the CFD, after you use the bilocal holography map, starts to give you non-local uh, relations between degrees of freedom near the boundary and degrees of freedom deep in the bulk. And these are the kind of relations that you would expect uh, based on the island formula. Okay, so I'm nearly finished. Let me just wrap up. So what future directions are there? It would be very nice to construct the um, bilocal map when we do a light cone quantization and not uh, when we do a canonical quantization, not a light cone quantization. It would also be nice to study something like a thermofield double state where you expect horizons in the bulk and then to explore uh, what of the behind the horizon physics can be extracted. And then one would like to consider uh, more complicated theories, in particular, something like N is equal to four super so Mills theory. Uh, but in this case, you're dealing with a multi-matrix model. It's very difficult to write down a set of invariant variables. For the single matrix, you can write down a set of invariants. That's just the eigenvalues. The resulting field theory is the Dasiewicki collective field theory, and that actually reproduces expectations from uh, Louisville theory. So the idea works in that case. Multi-matrices, we get stuck on the very first step in that we can't write down a useful set of gauge invariant variables for the multi-matrix model. And uh, thank you. That's uh, what I wanted to say. Thank you, Robert, for the very nice talk. Uh, let's see if we have some questions from the audience. There are no questions here. We check now uh, with the online participants. Oh, Carlos. Okay. Carlos, please go ahead. Uh, Robert, can you hear me? <clears throat> yes, I can. Yeah, okay. Thanks, thanks very much. It's, it's very interesting physics. Uh, I ignore many details, so let me ask you first two questions, one a bit technical, one a bit of different character. So you talk about subregions in the CFT, subregions in the, in the bulk, right, in the ABS space. And what happens if I perform any diffeomorphism any, any transformation of coordinates in the ADS space, can I deform that subregion into something else? Can I make something that was very concentrated, very dissipated, say, or very enlarged? And, and so if I can do that on the ADS space, is there a similar thing I can do on the field theory? How, how, how you see that? Okay, I, I think that's a great question. Uh, it's something that we're trying to answer. You, you'll see that all I was doing today, we have a map, we have a mapping between the fields, and I was mainly talking about the geometry of that map. Uh, I think that a baby version of your question 
would be to take the large N expectation value of this bilocal field and to read off the classical values of all of the higher spin fields. Mm -hmm. Once you have these, to explicitly check that they obey the nice higher spin equations of motion and they match what we would expect for the ADS4 background. And in this situation, you could hope to perform something like a diffeomorphism, see how the higher spin fields transform and translate that into a transformation of the bilocal in the CFT. So that's actually what we're trying. I think it would be nice to somehow identify what, if you do a diffeo in the gravity, what are you doing in the CFT? But uh, I, I don't have an answer yet. That's part of work in progress. Okay. The, the second question is a bit more exploratory. So don't take it so seriously or, or dramatic as I'm going to phrase it. Suppose that I'm a conformal field theory person, right? I live on a conformal field theory and I create one of these by local operators by, for example, taking T mu in the point X, T mu in the point Y, right? So you explain us today that you can reconstruct the bulk with this. You can access points in the bulk, etc. So the question is, as a field theory person, what do I measure in order to learn what about the, the point in the bulk? What, what do I have to do? I'm a field theory person. I don't know the coordinate set. So what do I do and how do I read I'm, I'm in mean this point, I'm in mean that point, et cetera. Is yeah. the question clear? I think so. Um, so let me just make maybe a few comments. Mm. Um, I guess one of the key questions is to understand how the holographic dimension Z uh, emerges. And there was always this idea that somehow it's related to scale and that bigger objects in the CFT correspond to things which are deeper in the bulk. Uh, so one of the things that you see explicitly from the map is that Z is given by some factor multiplied by X1 minus X2. So certainly when you start to make the two points in the bilocal very far from each other, you are probing deeper and deeper into the bulk. Um, I guess another thing that you could do um, which was suggested uh, by Simmons Buffins and company earlier, would be to study correlators in the CFT and to find singularities that you wouldn't expect just from a weak coupling analysis based on the Coleman-Norton theorem. And that would suggest that somehow there's some local higher dimensional bulk emerging. So I guess those are the kinds of things to see that there's a local bulk so far from the point of view of bilocal holography, I'm not 